This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. Terry Curran is the founder and president of Alpha Dogs. It's a Burbank-based post-production facility founded in 2002. But he's not the only one at Alpha Dogs. Another gentleman there is, uh, is Eric Valenzuela, who's an audio mixer. As we talked with Philip last segment about the process of creating production sound, this segment we want to talk with Terry and Eric about the process of post-production sound. Hello, Terry. Welcome back. Hey, Larry. Hey, Michael. Hi, Larry. Um, We've uh, been talking about production sound with um, Mr. Philip, and that got us thinking about post-production sound. And while you may not be out in the field shooting all the time, you are worrying a lot about doing post-production audio. So one of the things that you had recently at the Editor's Lounge was a panel where audio mixers all got together to talk about post-production sound. What was the takeaway that you got from that panel? Uh, Actually, for me, it was a lot of, of things that I was surprised uh, about how, you know, how to prep projects properly, uh, what things to put in there, what kind of things don't actually come across. I was surprised to hear some of that. But Eric was actually one of the guys on the panel, so he could probably answer that better than me. I know, but I'm going to talk to you first, and then we'll get Eric in. What was your takeaway? We want to get at least five minutes of Terry before we get into everything else. Yeah, so, I mean, Terry, Terry, I I would love to get your sense of what your take is on audio, then we're going to bring Eric in. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, it was interesting um, hearing Philip talk about it because, you know, we, uh, we record a show together also, and, uh, you know, our audio is not the, the level of audio that I would do for um, a feature presentation, let's say. Mm-hmm. But we do a lot of reality shows. We work on a lot of reality shows, and that audio leaves a lot to be desired. That's uh, more like what Philip's talking about. And, you know, trying to get it all evened out from a bunch of different sources is challenging. <laughs> um, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the the our, our mixers like Eric can work miracles, but I'm not supposed to say that because <laughs> they'll get mad because they get more bad audio. Yeah, but I know that mixers don't want to work miracles. They want a, an easy job. What is what is our job? Yeah. What is our job? What what do we need to do? Well, let's uh, let's yeah. hold. Oh, is that a question you're going to ask five minutes? Yeah, because you know as well as I do that Terry is the boss and doesn't really know, know what's going on. So and, we're going to invite Eric, <laughs> and, and Terry has opinions. And uh, <laughs> I want to invite Eric Valenzuela into the conversation. Eric is an audio mixer at Alpha Dogs, and uh, uh, Eric, good to have you with us. Good to have you. Good to be here. Actually, thank you very much. Uh, so help Terry out here. What do editors need to know about uh, getting audio ready for a post mix? <laughs> Well, there's uh, there's actually a lot of things that can really help to uh, um, expedite the process, and I would say the most important thing is just using the best audio available. And for the most part, that would be like using a lav instead of a boom, um, because there's more flexibility in in adjusting the audio to match certain situations from using the lav. Now, and wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> that goes against everything I have Absolutely. ever heard. Absolutely. I was kind of flabbergasted at that. Because you, you, the lav picks up clothing rustle, the lav picks up somebody hitting their chest, and the boom at least isolates you from that. Back up that statement. Yeah, I, we could I, put a windsock on a boom. So ex- explain this to me. Well, see, like Terry had said, we work on a lot of reality TV, and so sometimes we have multiple contestants and... They sometimes don't want to use other people's responses or they want to stick to a certain storyline, so they only want to use uh, one contestant uh, audio to keep the story going. So we need to cut everybody else out, so that gives us more flexibility. If we have a boom, then everybody's in there, it's all married together, and we have no flexibility on who we want to hear and who we don't want to hear. Okay, so what you're using is is you don't want to use the the lavalier in in place of a boom. You're using the lavalier on each one of the actors so you can isolate each channel and then pull up just the actor that you need for that particular moment. So it's not that the lav has got better audio, it's just that it's isolated. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct, and for the most part, like uh, uh, on reality shows, there's a lot of moving around. It's not like a set where people are 
standing in a certain place and the there's a controlled environment where there's no air conditioners on or there's no cars passing by. Sometimes they film on the street, so we have to, uh, if there was a boom on a street scene, then there would be way too much traffic. And like, let's say they need to make an edit and there's a car passing by, then we that can get a little tricky sometimes on the boom. Okay, so we've got a bunch of isolated microphones in our video edit. What do we need to hand off to the audio editor? Because there's really two sides to this question. The first is, what do you want? And what problems do we cause audio that we should start to avoid? But first, tell me what you want. Uh, I would say what I want, and I, I usually request when I, I do talk to the uh, editors, is... Uh, Give us the best audio possible. Um, like if there was a boom and a lot going on at the same time, I'll take both of them and use the best one sometimes. For the edit, if I see that there's a, there's a better chunk of the boom that sounds better, then I'll use that. But like like I said, like sometimes on reality shows, there's so much moving around and there's so many people talking at the same time. We just really want to hear what that person's saying, the one that they have on camera and they're focusing on. So that's why I said, you know, using the log is the best, uh, is the best option in that scenario. And so cutting out, you I would say more. Say again, Terry. Uh, so, so basically you're saying you want more, you want all the audio tracks if possible. No, not all of them. Like, uh, I would say just the, if if there's like let's just say there's four contestants and they have a boom going, in that case I would pretty much only use the uh, the law the contestants from the laws because I know for the most part uh, people are always trying to get camera time and stuff so they try to respond to everything or have an opinion about everything but when they're cutting the story you know we need to stick to whoever's talking and that way the the law will give us just that pertinent person's answer or perspective or opinion. And it doesn't marry, you know, that other uh, extra audio that maybe people will try to focus on where they don't want them to focus, the producer might not want them to focus on. And, like, what really helps us is if you could, if editors would delete any audio that just is not necessary because when we get a show and it's full of thousands of audio files, we have to dig through there to make sure that we're getting what we need to hear and what is necessary for the uh, for the actual show we're working on. And so sometimes if there's a lot of extra mics or extra audio in there, it can turn into a, a long process to split the show out. Hmm. <laughs> so first you want all the different audio sources that we've got available. And Not all of them. What else, what else can we give you that makes your life easier? Uh, like I said, well, it's pretty much... Hey, Eric. Eric, one of the things okay. you pointed out, one of the things that you pointed out was having all of um, having the audio on the proper track. In other words, all of the dialogue <laughs> on one track and et cetera. Well, do yeah. <coughs> excuse me. Whoa, do uh, do do people give you tracks all over the place? I mean, what do they what do they give you that you would have to educate well, them to give you in the proper track? You know, it happens all the time. I'm actually really? looking at a session right now where the music is on the top tracks and the middle tracks, the bottom tracks. It's just all over the place. Wow. And that makes it pretty difficult for us to, to grab it because to make network specs for the splits, we need to make sure that all the music is on the music tracks, all the dialogues on the dialogue tracks, and the effects are on the uh, effects tracks. So that way, when we split the show out for the splits, you know, everything is isolated outside of the mix track. So, why, wait, But wait a second. It, why is that so important? Explain to me why track assignments make such a big deal to you. Well, what I try to tell the editors is, if they can, just have the primary talkers on top, responders just below it, and uh, effects below that, and then the music below that. So when I open up the the, the output, when I'm going to start working on the show, I could look at it and just start grabbing the music, putting the music on the effects tr on the music tracks. And the, like I said, putting all the I have a template that has all the tracks labeled. So like I said, everything gets routed to the right to the right stems necessary for for the uh, network splits, and so. Splitting out a show, an hour show can take me anywhere from four hours on an organized show 
through up to 12 to 16 hours on a very unorganized one-hour show because I have to listen to almost every audio file to make sure that I'm not missing anything. And I'd rather spend that time being creative or fixing edits and stuff instead of splitting out the show just because it was kind of messy or sloppy in the setup. So what you're saying, though, is it's the same thing that we should be sending to every post-production sound house, right? Not just you. Not the, just the way that you work, but every place, right? I would say the mixer or whoever's splitting out the show would really appreciate a very organized uh, uh, session when they get it. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm looking at a session right now where stuff is just all over the place, and now I have to dig through it. You know, I was, the music is easy to recognize, and the effects are e easy to recognize, but you just have to pull it from different tracks and stuff where it would just be nice if it was just all on the bottom. You just grab it, put it all on your music tracks, you know, and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, it doesn't always happen that way. And like I said, it, it saves, you know, every minute saves. Oh, sure. It just, yeah. You know, it helps. And every time you open your mouth saves a lot of people a lot of money. <laughs> so the, uh, yeah. the, the is there right. a, do we need to take make or make special arrangements if we're going to send something to Pro Tools? Does Pro Tools have functions that video editors need to pay attention to when they're getting ready to prep their projects? I would say one of the most important things is um, it handles on all the audio files. Oh yeah, uh, and when. Uh, outputting for uh, a quick time, um, like if you don't have the uh, the uh, Avid hardware for for the video, if you're just going to use the internal uh, output uh, uh, for um, from Pro Tools, it only takes MOVs. So like sometimes people will send me M4Vs or different uh, video compression settings. Um, that kind of made things a little difficult for Pro Tools. So for the most part, what I do is I'll send, uh, when I know there's an output coming, I'll just send like a little output procedure to the editor so that way he matches all the necessary uh, parameters to uh, help Pro Tools just ingest everything quickly and correctly. Now define handles from an audio point of view. What does that word mean? Well, when we get a audio file, like let's just say they cut in um, dialogue, um, and uh, there's uh, a uh, dialogue edit or something on there where they want them to say a certain thing in a sentence, it really helps if we could pull out the ends of the audio files um, so we could maybe get room tone, or maybe we could get uh, the end of a cutoff word. If there's no handles, then we're stuck there with that cutoff word, or maybe we won't be able to get room ambience to fill up little holes. Natural room ambience from that from that day was recorded, which would sound a lot better instead of putting some generic background white noise. It just helps for the ambience to have it all matched. That way, there's a nice, good flow to the mix, and there's not these like you know weird sounding or nothing should ever sound weird. If, it weird, if it's weird, we're not doing our, right, our job right. So I just try to make everything sound as smooth and uh, um, non-jarring or, you know, just sound good and smooth throughout. One of the terms we've been hearing a lot about recently in, in terms of audio levels and final output is the Calm Act. What is the Calm Act <laughs> and what does it, it mean? It doesn't work. What is the video? What's the hush? It doesn't. <laughs> what's what's the relationship of the Calm Act to what you're creating, and how do we need to worry about our levels when we're feeding it to you? In other words, do video editors need to care? Uh, ooh, Terry, can you help me with that? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, as a video editor, I'm going. It's not my problem. It's the audio guy. <laughs> 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 and we should tell everybody what the Com Act is, right? So the, it's the commercials. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's the commercials. They have a set limit of volume on it. Where it used to be, if you go from the television show to the commercial, the commercial volume would go. Whee! Well, it's not supposed to be that way yeah, anymore. It's but it's baloney. It's, uh, well, the idea the idea is that you know traditionally we had a spec of you know say it's minus twenty. Wherever your your point is that that's the peak that you can have, and. The problem is that even though you're looking at a VU meter and you go, oh, it looks like everything is right there, it can sound different. So there's, you know, wh how the human ear hears is different than how a VU meter actually works. So you could be legal 
within the VU meter, but the sound sounds really loud. And, you know, they do that by mixing a lot of sound into that same space, you know, like a bright color, let's say, versus a dim color, but still within one little bolt of video, you know, to say on the video side. Mm -hmm. So commercials are always mixed as hot as possible so that they really pop out, whereas a television show isn't mixed that way. But what happens is you go from a TV show to a commercial, and the commercials sound like they're really loud. If you look on a VU meter, they're not any hotter than the television show. Michael, Michael so the Thomas. Comac is oh, go, no, I'm sorry. designed to get around that. And the Dolby, Dolby came out with their LM100 first, which is they claim that they can analyze more as the human ear hears it. So that's the, uh, the loudness level as opposed to the actual volume. That makes sense. Yeah. I I use a uh, on on my mix. I use a the Dolby Media Meter, and uh, we for actually uh, all networks that I'm working with now, they are asking for minus 24 for your dialogue as an average. So you have to be within two dB of minus 24. So you just have to mix your dialogue using that uh, Dolby Media Meter, and it all has, like I said, average about minus 24. So you're always keeping an eye as you're mixing your show to make sure that you're within in the legal limits for the for the specs, now, I should, and that I should, really helps. Eric, I should mention that the minus 24 is actually an average level, not a peak level. So for editors sure. that don't have average audio levels on their system, setting the peaks to minus 24 is going to be really, really way too quiet. So just that there's exactly. a difference in measuring stuff. I could talk about audio for probably yeah, the next this, uh, five, uh, or things, uh, five or six things, five or six days. Michael Thomas just posted the uh, Comac complaint. There's a plug-in. For Avid and Pro Tools. Yes. It's by Nugent Audio, according to what Michael tells us. And there's a, a, another one is uh, Tech Electronic, TC Electronics, which is the one that's bundled with Premiere. And there's another one that works with Final Cut 10, which allows you to monitor average levels. But we're going to be out of time. Terry Curran is the founder and president of Alpha Dogs. His website is alphadogs.tv. This is fun. And Eric Valenzuela is an audio mixer with Alpha Dogs. And Eric and Terry, thanks so very much for joining us. It's been a fun and we visit. We didn't get to hear Terry's strong opinions. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Good night.